Thanks, you'll be seated. We are studying um, the life of Joseph. Last week we started the series and we talked about the idea of Joseph and we spent a lot of time on his background with the idea and understanding that Joseph came from a very, very dysfunctional family. Um, we looked at the idea of the past and how the generational things were at play in this family. We talked about the idea that your past does not determine your future. Your choices do. We're in a culture which likes to blame its past for where it is right now, but the reality of it is Joseph is a great example of somebody whose family would have been a great excuse, but instead he broke the chain of generational issues and really became a unique individual to set a different course. We talked about the idea of one of the things that was true in their family was this idea of favoritism. And we talked about how his dad had shown that because his dad had learned that as well. And we talked about how his dad, even with this coat of many colors, this very colored coat that he gave him, ended up being really a source of irritation to his brothers. And you're going to see this morning how it continues to spiral until finally we're going to find Joseph, not this morning, but in a few weeks in a pit. So this morning, I want us to pick up where we left off last week, and I want to show you another set of things that's going to kind of push Joseph's brothers against him even more. Um, it's found in Genesis chapter 37. Here's what it says. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Remember last week, they, didn't want to, they, would, they couldn't say a nice thing about him. Now they hated him even more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? You will, act, will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. I don't know how you can hate more than hate, but there keeps getting more and more levels of it. Then he said, then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, listen, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars, he's got 11 brothers, were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. So this is the passage this morning we want to look at. We want to look at these two dreams and we want to talk about some things that will help us as we head into the week. Um, first of all, let's look at the first dream. It has to do with these sheaves, and the idea is this, that they're binding sheaves, and, and as they're doing it, like, think wheat, and uh, Joseph stands upright, and 11 other sheaves of wheat start bowing down to it. Now, what's unusual about this is these guys are not farmers, these guys are shepherds, and yet they would have done some of this, so they were familiar with the concept, so... What you have here is you have Joseph then coming to his brothers going, hey guys, guess what? I had a dream. Now, remember this. What's he wearing? He's got his coat on that his daddy has given him to basically say, you know what? You don't have to work as hard as your brother. And by the way, you need to know, Reuben's not going to get, get everything. You were my firstborn of Rachel, which is the wife that I really wanted and loved anyway. So guess what? You're going to be the ruler. So he's standing there in his fancy little colored garment and going, hey, I had a dream, guys. Guess what? You're all going to bow down to me. 17 years old, by the way. A lot of zeal, not a lot of wisdom, but a lot of zeal at this point. And his brothers just get even madder. Now, then he comes and... A day or so later or whatever, he shows up and goes, hey, I had another dream. This dream, however, has to do with the solar system. Now, again, at this, in this 
point in the world, you have to understand, they don't have the knowledge of the heavenly bodies that we do. So everything was tied to paganism and things like that. And so he then says, the sun and the moon and the stars, 11 stars, are going to bow down to me. Um, I mean, at this point, he's not helping himself at all at this point. Um, now, let me say a couple things before we get too far into this. First of all, in, in the study of Joseph, here's what you're going to find. The dreams always come in pairs. Okay? You see it here. You see it with the butler and the baker. And you're going to see it again with Pharaoh. So you're gonna, they're going to come in pairs. So there's a reason for that. Um, one dream could be a bad pizza. Two dreams saying the same thing are kind of a confirmation that this is something that is supernatural. We'll talk more about that in a second. Well, the other thing that's very, very interesting about these dreams is one of them, I believe, is sourced in the world of the Hebrews, and the second dream is sourced in the world of the Egyptians. The world of the, the, the Hebrews was an agrarian, um, you know, cattle, um, uh, crop kind of world. So I think what you see in this, in the first dream, is a couple of things. First of all, I think it has this idea of the Hebrew world. And if you'll think about it for a minute, when this dream is fulfilled, is when his brothers, because there's a famine in the land, go down to Egypt, and what do they ask for? Grain. So this is a grain dream, so to speak. And in the first dream, who goes down? You know, the brothers are going down there. And they're having to bow before the ruler, which is Joseph. They just don't know it at the time. So you have that kind of scenario. Um, and again, I understand there's, there, there's little holes in that too, but that's, I think that's a general idea. The second dream involves the solar system, the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's an Egyptian world. You see, in the Egyptian world, they worshipped Ray, the, god of the sun god. Remember when we went through Moses and all of the gods that they had and how each plague was actually an attack on one of the gods? That's the world of the Egyptian. So I think it, it kind of has this twofold idea as, as we look into it. So basically, and then what I think is very, very unique in the story, is when Joseph tells his daddy... His daddy actually rebukes him. Now, to me, that's amazing. Because his dad didn't get upset when his sons wiped out an entire city at Shechem. He doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't say anything about it when his daughter is raped. He doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't say anything about it when his oldest son takes one of his concubines. He doesn't say anything about it. But when Joseph... His favorite child, at this point, starts talking rulerish. He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And I don't know if it's because he realized, look, your brothers are mad enough. This is going to push them over the edge. You just need to, to shut up. You need to be quiet. But he does confront him. It's one of the only times you see him confronting something, which is, I think, interesting. But the text ends with the idea of his brothers got madder and madder and madder, and eventually they're going to put him in a pit. Because you can't let bitterness and jealousy and anger go unchecked. At some point, it's going to manifest itself, and that's what you're going to see with the brothers. But it says that his dad pondered this in his heart. And I think that's interesting. Because in a little while... That dream is going to be shattered because in his mind, he's going to have lost Joseph. But yet it says, he wondered if there was something unique about what God had said and God had spoken to him in the dream. So, you go, okay, um, how in the world, I'm going to work tomorrow. Really? Where, where, where are you going with this? All right. So hang on because I do actually have a, an application for this thing. Um, and, and, and here's what we have to understand as we, do, as, as we look at this. In the Old Testament world at this time, you have to remember, there is no written word of God. There's no Moses and the Ten Commandments. That's still to come. 
So even the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, written by Moses, don't exist. So here's a question for you. So how does God speak to people? How do people know what to do and what they should do and what's from God and what God wants them to do? How do they know that? There's no Holy Spirit currently indwelling people. There's no Bible. There's no anything. How does that happen? How does God communicate to human beings at this point in history? And one of the things that you'll find in Genesis, if you start reading it from Genesis 1 up to where we are, one of the ways that God did that was through dreams. Uh, it's happened quite a bit in Genesis up to this point. And Bimelech was the guy who took Sarah, Abraham's wife, and Abraham didn't speak up. Generational thing. He didn't want to die, so he said, you just go ahead and take my wife. I just won't say anything, and you, know, you just take her. And knowing that this is wrong, and Bimelech, in a dream, God reveals to him, she's married. Don't touch her. And then he comes to Abraham and goes, uh, is this your wife? Oh, yeah, I didn't want to say anything. Uh, excuse me? Um, do you know what could have happened here? And so we have that story. Um, you even have Jacob, who, um, Joseph, who you have this idea of Jacob. Remember the story, the, the dream that Jacob has with Jacob's ladder? Um, Jacob, um, Laban, who, um, at, at this thing, Laban gets a dream about how to, uh, about how not to mess with Jacob. Uh, J Jacob gets a dream about how to do his cattle in such a way to, to make them his herd grow. <clears throat> so this is kind of a common way that God has been real. And you're going to see this in Joseph. You're going to see it in the life of, of Joseph. You're going to see it in the butler and the baker. You're going to see it in Pharaoh. Dreams were a big part of what they, how God revealed to them. That's why pairs were so important, because pairs actually confirmed it so it wasn't just a, something that, that, that came out of it. So what you have to understand is at this point in history, this is the way God communicates. And God has a very specific reason for giving Joseph these dreams. Because you see, what's going to happen is Joseph is going to head into a very dark, deep journey of a lot of bitterness, a lot of things that are going to happen to him. And through all of that, God wants to give him this glimmer of hope that, Joseph, there's something past all of this. So early in his life, God gives Joseph these dreams, and ultimately these dreams are going to have to carry him for the next 13-plus years. That he can always come back to the idea, well, I know God said this, and so there's something in this situation that God will use. And at the end of his life, you see this play out. When Joseph looks at his brothers, they make up this story, and Joseph looks at them, I think heartbroken. And he says, guys, you don't understand. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So as you look at this, you have to understand the purpose of this thing was for God to be able to give Joseph hope. So we come out to question, and this is the issue that comes up a lot. Is that how God works today? What about dreams? I had this dream that, I can't tell you the number of times I hear that. I had this dream that, you know, and da-da-da. And, and, and here's what I'm saying. I'm not going to say that's, I'm not going to say God doesn't use that. I don't want to go that far. But here's what I will say. It's not God's primary method of communication. And I think it's probably the least effective method of communication. I'm not saying can't do it. And, and here's the analogy I'd make. How did you get to church this morning? Most of you got in a car, you turned on the thing, or you pushed a button, and you drove here. That was the most effective. That was the quickest. That was the most convenient. That was the most secure way to get here. There are a lot of ways to get here today. You could have woke up and said, you know what? I'm going to walk to church today. Cammie and Randy, no big deal. Kimmy walks up here a lot. Um, I'm six miles away. I get to the top of my hill, I'm done. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I could have walked, right? I mean, I got, it would have gotten me here, right? But it's not the most effective way, is it? Um, by the same token, um, I could have gotten on my motorcycle. But I happen to know that at the temperature it was when I left this morning, how I would have to have dressed 
to get on my motorcycle. I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but it's not most. I could have ridden a bike if I had one. Um, I could, I could have, I could have gone out and saddled up a horse, and and come to church on my horse. There's a lot of ways I could get here, but the most effective and the most efficient way is the way we usually do things. And with God, it's the same way. So my question to you would be, what are the ways that God works to communicate what he wants for us? Because we all struggle here. God, you know, I don't know what I should do financially. I don't know what I should do with my job. I don't know what I should do with how I raise my kids or whether I should make this decision or I don't know if I should do this or I should do that. We all struggle with directions and what does God say about this and what is, and, and we want to hear from God so what I want to ask ourselves this morning is <clears throat> how is God going to communicate with us for Joseph it was dreams at that point in history in the Bible history of stuff that's the primary way God communicated how does God primarily communicate today because if you want to hear from God if you want to know what God wants you to do you want to know God's direction, God's plan, God's whatever, how is God going to do that today? So, four things. Here's the first one. His word. We are fortunate. We live in a country where not only do we have the Bible in our own language, we have the Bible in different versions and translations in our own language. We have study Bibles. All, we, have, we, have, we have Bibles on our phone. Um, we are surrounded by, again, at this point in history, they didn't even have the first five books of the Bible. And we've got God's revelation where God has spoken and somebody has taken the time to write it down as God inspired them and then God preserved it so that we, hundreds of years later, in some cases thousands of years later, get to put it in our hands. Do you understand that until the printing press came along in 1600 or so, that very, there, were, there was only one group of people who actually had access to a Bible, and that was clergy. And in order for them to read the Bible, they had to know Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So the people, you, were totally dependent upon what those people said. But when the 1600s came along and they put the Bible in the English language of the common people for the first time, that was revolutionary. That you could read it for yourself. Listen to what 1 Corinthians says. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. You ever had a Bible argument with somebody who's not a Christian? And cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit, Christian, makes judgment about all things because such a person is not subject to merely human judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we, speaking of Christians, have the mind of Christ. He says, you need to understand, you have the ability now to go and pick up a Bible and read it and actually understand it for yourself. You, you understand how rare a privilege that is? You go, well, I just come to church and let you tell me. No. You need to be reading it for yourself. That's how you will find the mind of God. That's how you will grow. That's how you will stretch. It needs to be you. Don't, don't depend on somebody else to tell you something when you can do it yourself. You want to be able to figure it out on your own. And you go, yeah, but... And, and here's, I don't understand a lot of it. <clears throat> then get a version that makes it easier for you to understand it. Because you see, when you're trying to figure out how do I raise my kids, everything you need's in here. How do I make decisions on my finances? It's in here. How do I handle this situation with my boss? It's in here. How do I handle this situation with my government? It's in here. How do I end up Dealing with this person who won't forgive me. It's in here. What do I deal with? How do I deal with it when I will not, I do not want to forgive this person? Answer's in here. God has put this in your hand. These are, we call it the word of God. These are the words of God. This is what God wants you to know. Again, 
Can God reveal in dreams? Yes, but I look at it and go, why would he do that when, he's already got, when we've already got this? This is clear. You know what? I, I know what it says and I don't like it. That's your problem. You know, that's your problem. It's not God's problem. God said this is the way it is. You, whether you like it or not, it's not, you know, he used to say years and years ago, that, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, that settles it. Don't care what you believe. If God said it, that's the way it is. But we have the word of God, so we can find out what God wants us to do in a given situation. Listen to the next thing he says. Um, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? It's the same way no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have received, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught to us by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. Here's what he's saying. When you and I pray, when we make prayer a part of our world, then the Holy Spirit starts to speak to our hearts and things start to become clearer. Um, this is so important. This is why we put out a prayer list every week because we want to be praying for each other. This is why this whole church was, was founded and sourced in this ed attitude of prayer. God, we don't know what to do here. What, how, what does your word say? How do, we, how do we respond to it? And what happens, have you ever, ever met somebody and you just know that they're Christian? You just know? And, the, and talking to them? That's the spirit of God in their life and the spirit of God in your life. Clicking. Why? Ever had those discussions with people and they don't, they're just clueless? Different spirit. Spirit of the world versus the spirit of Christ. And that's so important for us to understand that that's how God's going to speak to us. Third way that God speaks to us. Oh, I don't have a verse for it. I have a whole chapter for it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. The body of Christ. Fellowship. I'm thrilled you're here this morning. I really am. Um, but can I be very honest with you? This isn't enough. You need to fellowship with other Christians throughout the week. Whether it be texting somebody, whether it be calling them, whether it be running into them, whether it be meeting them. The importance of fellowship and God speaking to your heart is so, so, so important. Because fellowship allows somebody to outside of your little circle of issues and problems to all of a sudden speak to your heart about things. And that, it's so important that you have people like that um, in your life. And this is what I would say to you, you, those of you who are younger, who are trying to make decisions on, 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 on life issues and you know, marriage and parenting and, all, and, and careers and all that kind of thing. Find people who are godly people who you can go to and ask questions of. Who you can go to and say, pray for me here. I've got this situation and I'm not sure what to do. This morning we talked about 31 years here. So let me share you a story that I've shared bits and pieces of over the years. But let me give you the whole story. Back when I was a youth pastor before this ministry, I had left that, that deal and I had gone to work. And one of the things that I went and talked to the pastor about was the idea. I said, look, I want the teenagers to know that I'm not in this for the money. So even though I have another job, I still want to continue to work with the teenagers. And so I started doing that. And I'd done that for a few months, and then the rumbling started in the church, and there were people who thought I was trying to brainwash the teenagers to convince their parents to do something or lead this way or go that way. So it got really muddy really fast. So we had an evangelist coming in for a week of meetings, and he was a, he was a seasoned guy, um, and he was a godly man, and I had a lot of confidence and a lot of trust in him. So as a youth pastor, as a, as a young guy, I went to him, and I said, look, I said, here's the deal. 
I said, this is what I want to do because I have a heart for the kids. I don't want to leave the kids hanging. But I said, it's being misinterpreted on this end of it, and I don't know what to do. I said, so here's what I want you to do. I met with him when he first got there. I said, I want you to pray about it all week. I want you to talk to anybody you want to talk to. I don't care who you talk to. But at the end of the week, I'm going to come back into your trailer, and I'm going to ask you what I should do. I said, I'm so overwhelmed by the scenario that I just don't know what to do. I'm too close. I need somebody who can be objective, who's godly, who can give me some direction here. And I didn't see him. I didn't talk to him about the issue for the rest of the week. I went into his trailer the last night of the meeting. And I said, well, I said, what do you think? He said, well, he said, I don't want to tell you what to do. He said, but. He said, this is my assessment. He said, the Bible talks about the idea of no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He said, I think your struggle is you're trying to keep a foot in both worlds. He said, I think you would be much better to just make a clean break and move on. He said, no matter what you do, it's going to be misinterpreted. But he said, the Bible principle of going forward without looking back is a really solid idea. So I went back to the senior pastor the next week and I said, as of I will continue for two more weeks. At the end of two weeks, you're going to have to find somebody else to completely do youth group. You know what I did after that? I started filling pulpit. We know where I ended up three months later? Right here. Right here. I say that to say this. It was because of fellowship, it was because of godly people, it was because of my willingness to listen to them and my willingness to go to them and to have a connection with them that played a pivotal role in my life. I'm thrilled that you're here. But the fact that you need to be able to get together with people outside of here, outside of these walls, whether it be a phone or a text or whatever else, fellowship becomes, that's the problem right now with the online thing. I understand online fills a need for a little bit, but the thing that the online lacks is the fellowship, the face-to-face, the pull away all of the stuff so you can actually share with each other. And that is so important. It is so important. That's one of the things, you know, that's one of the things I get excited about with the ladies. I mean, you know, I don't want anything to do with the crazy stuff they do, but I know that when they get together, there's a whole lot more happening than just whatever event it is they have planned. They get to share heart to heart, and they get to encourage each other and pray for one another and laugh and cry and do all of those things together. Why? Because fellowship is an essential part of making godly decisions. And you have a circle around you of people who can help you and guide you and encourage you and strengthen you. And that is so important. Even Joseph does that. You find Joseph when he's in prison, he starts making friends with the other prisoners. Why? Because he understands the value of that. And the last thing are circumstances. I put it last because it needs to be last. Too often we try to make decisions and what God wants us to do by looking at the circumstances. And we let that be the overriding idea. It's the last and in my opinion the least most important thing you do. And here's why. Why? Often in circumstances, what do we do? God, I want to try to see you in the circumstances. So we spend all of our energy starting with the circumstance, trying to find God. Instead of starting with God and saying, God, whatever circumstance you put me in, I will honor you. What happens to us, we get in difficult circumstances and how we start praying. God, get me out of it. God, get me out of it. God, get me out of it. Why? Because we start with the circumstance instead of God. And the thing you see in the life of Joseph, Joseph starts with God. So whatever circumstance he finds himself in, whether it's in the top or whether it's on the bottom, he sees all of it from God. And he realizes his goal in all of it is to glorify God. Because you're going to see him help people 
and they forget him and he doesn't get bitter. You're going to watch him be in a position where he can squash his brothers like bugs. And he looks at him and says, God was involved in all. This isn't about you guys. This is about God involved in all of this, and he's used it for good. In fact, guys, he's used it so I can help you. There's no question God's at work around you this week. There's no question that many of you want to serve and follow God this week. How do you do that? How do you sense God's leading? How do you sense God's direction in it? You start with his word. And you find a way to do that, whether it's an app, whether it's the daily bread, whether it's a, a Bible that you just pick up. You go, I don't even know where to start. Start in the book of James. Just start there. Five book, five chapters. We read a chapter a day. You really want to get ambitious? Go to Proverbs. There's one chapter for every day. Just start reading it and let God work. Pray. It may be nothing more than two or three minutes. It may be nothing more than, you know what, while I'm gassing up, I've decided that every time I put gas in my car, I'm going to pray while I'm gassing up. What else are you going to do? Stand there and watch the little screeny thing? Giving you some thing that you don't even care about? Or when you're driving to work? Or as you pass by houses of people that you know? Or you run into somebody and you walk away and you pray for them as you walk away. But pray. And fellowship. Call somebody this week, encourage them. Check in on them. And see God first, not your circumstance. And watch what God's going to do. We talked about this morning, the past 30 years here. You want to know how this place is where it is today? Started with the Word of God. God, what do you want us to do? Bathed in prayer. God, don't let us mess this up. Focused on fellowship. Getting together at every opportunity they could and talking and encouraging one another and helping one another and find out what's going on in their life so I can pray for them. Or maybe there's something I can do for you that I can, I've got a resource that you don't know about and you can do this. And then when the circumstances came along, it's like, God, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, here we are trying to serve you. You just wiped out our basement. It's all full of water. What are we going to do now? Oh, we'll see what God's going to do. And we've stood back and in amazement, been able to see his fingerprints all over. Joseph is going to do the exact same thing. God knows what's ahead for him. So early in his life, as a 17-year-old, God gives him these two dreams and says, look, I just want you to know, Joseph, I've got great things planned for you. And you're going to think that I've abandoned you, but I want you to go back to these two dreams because I want you to remember, I'm going to do something so far beyond what you have in mind. And I am with you every step of the way to get you there. But you're going to have to wait and you're going to have to trust me, and you're going to have to know that I'm at work. And the one thing you're going to see about Joseph, no matter what is thrown at him, he starts with God, and he sticks close to God, and he doesn't give up. And God uses him. In, it, 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 it's mind-boggling when you understand the dynamics of this story of a Hebrew guy becoming second in command in the most powerful pagan place in all the world. Because God has a journey he's going to take Joseph on, and he wants him to know, I'm with you every step of the way, and it's no different for you, no different for me. So I end this morning with this idea. Seek his word this week. Pray. Ask him to use you. Fellowship and encourage each other. And start with God in whatever circumstances you're struggling with right now. And let him use you. Let's pray. Lord, help us to grow this week. Thank you for loving us, for caring for us, for giving us your word, for giving us the Holy Spirit, for giving us the opportunity, Lord. 
to make a difference. So in all that we do this week, Lord, may we draw close to you. And we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise of these things we ask in your name. Amen.